Hi everyone, this lesson is on the signs and symptoms of type 1 diabetes. Before we get into the signs and symptoms, let's talk about what type 1 diabetes is. Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune condition involving destruction of pancreatic beta cells that leads to a lack of insulin production and impaired glucose regulation. So it's an autoimmune condition, which means that the patient's own immune system attacks the patient's own tissues. And in this case, it attacks the cells within the pancreas, the beta cells, which are responsible for producing insulin. And once enough beta cells have been destroyed, it's going to cause the pancreas to not be able to produce enough insulin to regulate glucose. So there's going to be impaired glucose regulation. So lack of insulin is going to lead to very high levels of glucose. And this lack of insulin is also going to lead to increased fat breakdown because insulin itself induces fat formation. If there's no insulin present, there's going to be an elevation of another hormone known as glucagon. And this is going to lead to increased fat breakdown and then eventual increased ketone production. So this is going to lead to some characteristic signs and symptoms we're going to talk about in this lesson. So what are some of the risk factors for actually getting type 1 diabetes? Family history is going to be a big one. So there is an association between certain HLA types and getting type 1 diabetes and other autoimmune conditions. And one of them that I mentioned here is celiac disease. So individuals with type 1 diabetes are more likely to have celiac disease. So there is an association. Now, what is the epidemiology of type 1 diabetes? Out of all cases of diabetes, 10% of them are going to be type 1 diabetes. So type 2 diabetes is going to be the most common type, representing approximately 90% of cases. And the onset of type 1 diabetes is most often going to occur early in life, usually prior to early adulthood. So we're going to see it more often occurring in children or adolescents. So it's going to differ in its age of onset compared to type 2 diabetes. And what's noted here is that the onset and the symptoms of type 1 diabetes is going to present suddenly. And it's often going to present with what we call diabetic ketoacidosis. We're going to talk a bit about diabetic ketoacidosis and the signs and symptoms of diabetic ketoacidosis in this lesson as well. Now, the reason that signs and symptoms of type 1 diabetes occur oftentimes suddenly as opposed to type 2 diabetes, where they oftentimes occur insidiously, is because the immune system continues to attack and destroy those pancreatic beta cells we talked about before. And eventually, once enough of those pancreatic beta cells have been destroyed, usually representing around 90% of them, then we're going to see very high levels of glucose occurring. And then we're also going to see some of these signs and symptoms as well. Now, some of the signs and symptoms that can occur in type 1 diabetes include polyuria. Polyuria is an increased urination, more specifically urinating more often, so increased frequency of urination and increased urine volume. So you're going to the washer more often and then you're urinating more volume of urine each time you go. And this may also present as nocturia or enuresis. Nocturia is urinating at nighttime. So the patient often will have to wake up in the middle of the night to urinate. And this can happen many times as well. And then enuresis is bedwetting. So because this can occur in children, bedwetting can occur. And it's often going to be a secondary enuresis, which means that the child has developed where they do not bedwet anymore. And then all of a sudden they start to bedwet again. And this can also be another finding in patients with type 1 diabetes. Now, the reason that polyuria and some of these other symptoms occurs is because of high levels of glucose. Now, normally the kidneys reabsorb glucose. So the body wants to hold on to glucose. It is an energy source. But when there is too much glucose, the levels of glucose are too high, that glucose gets into the urine and then water follows that glucose. So glucose will act like a little sponge to pull water. And then that's why we're going to see patients with lots of episodes of urination and lots of urine volume. Now, polydipsia is also a related finding in type 1 diabetes. Polydipsia is increased drinking. So patients are going to feel very thirsty and they're going to feel very thirsty a significant amount of time. The reason they feel like this is because of all of those increased urine losses. So because they're losing so much volume, so much fluids, they're going to feel very thirsty and they're going to drink a lot of fluids to compensate. Type 1 diabetes patients can also experience polyphagia. Now, polyphagia is 
increased consumption of food. So they feel very hungry and they eat more than usual. And the reason is, is because of that lack of insulin we talked about before. So because there's no insulin, insulin sensitive cells are not going to be exposed to insulin. So they're not going to be able to access glucose. So insulin sensitive cells need glucose in order to bring glucose into those particular cells. Because those cells are not able to access that glucose, they're going to make the patient sense that they are hungry. So this is the reason why we can see polyphagy. Now we can also see weight loss occurring in type 1 diabetes. This is often significant weight loss that can occur. And with type 1 diabetes, patients as opposed to type 2 diabetes patients, type 1 diabetes patients are going to be thinner on average. So because they're lacking insulin, they are not able to produce or synthesize fats like they should be. So they oftentimes lose weight. And again, this is going to be due to lack of insulin that leads to a catabolic state, catabolic meaning that things are being broken down as opposed to being built up as would be in an anabolic state. And we can often see dehydration occurring. So this dehydration can be due to that polyuria losing lots of volume from that excessive urination. This can lead to dry mucous membranes. So looking at the tongue, you can see the tongue is very dry. We can also see that if the patient were to check their skin, if they were to pull up on their skin, it doesn't go down as easy as before. It's, there's poor skin turgor. The eyes can also be sunken and then there can be dry axilla, so their armpits can be dry. They may not be producing sweat, and then they may have no tears in some severe cases, so the patient may feel that their eyes are very dry. And then the dehydration can also lead to hypotension, which is a low blood pressure, so the patient may feel dizzy as well. Patients with type 1 diabetes can also experience blurred vision. The blurry vision can be due to increased glucose levels that cause osmosis and swelling of the lens of the eye, which can cause blurring of their vision, but can also be due to diabetic retinopathy, which is a complication of longstanding diabetes in general. So we're going to talk a bit more about this later on in this lesson. We can also see fatigue and lethargy occurring in type 1 diabetes, feeling tired, having low energy, maybe a common symptom of diabetes. And this is thought to be due to increased glucose levels due to lack of insulin. Now, patients with type 1 diabetes can also experience increased risk of infections. So they may see increased infections or increases in infections. Diabetes inhibits immune cell function. This can occur in both type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. So we can see patients having increased respiratory tract infections, but more specifically, they can often have increased fungal and yeast infections, particularly oral and vaginal yeast infections. And the reason is, is because the yeast candida albicans that causes a lot of these yeast infections proliferates when exposed to higher levels of glucose. This is a reason why we can see increased risk of yeast infections in particular. And there can also be delayed wound healing. So wound healing is impaired in diabetic patients. This is due to poor circulation that may develop during diabetes disease progression. So now that we've talked about some of those general signs and symptoms of type 1 diabetes, let's talk about diabetic ketoacidosis. So in type 1 diabetes, there can be diabetic ketoacidosis that can occur. And the reason is because in type 1 diabetes, there is a lack of insulin. Insulin production is severely compromised or completely lacking. This can lead to increased blood glucose and it can also lead to increased ketone production due to that increased fat breakdown. And we're not going to see this in type 2 diabetes because there's still insulin being present in type 2 diabetes to inhibit glucagon. So insulin inhibits glucagon. If there's no insulin around, glucagon is going to increase. This is another hormone that's basically the opposite of insulin. So glucagon increases and it's going to lead to increased fat breakdown. So we're going to get increased ketone production. And because of that excessive ketone body production, this can lead to acidosis. So these three, increased blood glucose, increased ketones, and increased acidosis leads to a condition we call diabetic ketoacidosis. Diabetic because there's increased blood glucose, keto because there's increased ketone production, and acidosis because there is acidemia or the blood is acidotic. So we can see diabetic ketoacidosis, oftentimes being the presenting issue in type 1 diabetic patients. So some of the signs and symptoms of diabetic ketoacidosis is going to include some of those signs and symptoms we talked about before, polyuria, polydipsia, fatigue. So those are going to be common in diabetic ketoacidosis as well. But we're also going to see nausea and vomiting occurring in diabetic ketoacidosis. 
It's often going to be severe nausea and vomiting. And oftentimes the patient vomits so much that they vomit basically everything out and they are left with dry heaves. This can occur in type 1 diabetic patients who are in DKA or diabetic ketoacidosis. And the reason is, is because acidemia causes nausea and vomiting. Nausea and vomiting can become so bad in these patients that they can oftentimes lead to a Mallory Weiss tear where there's a bit of a tear, a more superficial tear in the esophageal mucosa leading to a bit of blood in their vomit. Or it can be so bad that they can actually rupture and tear through their entire esophageal wall causing Borhoff syndrome. So there are a couple of complications that can occur from severe nausea and vomiting from diabetic ketoacidosis. Now, another very important finding in diabetic ketoacidosis is mental state changes. So oftentimes patients can have decreased alertness or awareness, decreased concentration, they can be confused, they can have decreased level of consciousness, and they can even go into a coma. So these can be very, very severe complications, and they are very important to recognize in patients with diabetic ketoacidosis. And it may occur in children and adolescents due to cerebral edema. So their brain starts to swell due to some electrolyte changes. And this is going to be a very, very important finding to note. Now, abdominal pain is also another very common symptom in diabetic ketoacidosis. This is going to be a severe abdominal pain with diffuse pain. So it's going to occur throughout their entire abdomen. This is, again, caused by diabetic ketoacidosis. And then patients who are in DKA can also have a fruity breath. And this fruity smelling breath is due to increased ketone body production. So this is the reason why we can see this as well. And there can be some breathing changes that can occur in late diabetic ketoacidosis as well. This is called Kussmaul breathing. So Kussmaul breathing is a pattern of increased volumes of breath. So there's often deep breathing or hyperpnea. And oftentimes the breath can be labored. So if we look at this diagram here, we can see this lighter gray line. And this is going to be tidal volume or tidal breathing. And with Kussmaul breathing, which is this darker line, we can see that there is increased volume of exhalation and increased inhalation. So we can see that there's going to be hyperpnea or deeper breathing, increased volumes of breath with Kussmaul breathing. And the reason that there's increased volume of breaths is because the patient is trying to blow off that acid. So this breathing change is going to be due to acidosis. Now there are particular complications of type 1 diabetes I want to mention here, and these are going to be the same as was noted in my type 2 diabetes lesson, but I want to show them here for completeness sake. So diabetic retinopathy can occur in type 1 diabetic patients. And this is, again, going to cause issues with blurry vision, vision loss, blindness, and can also lead to increased risk of cataracts and glaucoma later in life. Diabetic nephropathy is also another complication of type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. And this is going to lead to signs and symptoms of chronic kidney disease and oftentimes kidney failure and eventual dialysis. And then we can also see diabetic neuropathy occurring. So this is going to lead to paresthesias, which are numbness and tingling sensation in different parts of the body. So oftentimes it's going to start in the feet and the toes, and it can work its way up into different parts of the body closer to the core. And because of this diabetic neuropathy, the patient's not able to sense any injuries that they may experience. And because of that poor blood circulation we talked about before with that delayed wound healing, they have increased susceptibility for getting amputations. And then some other associated conditions include gastroparesis, which is stomach paralysis. This is tied in with the neuropathy. So this is a neuropathy of the vagus nerve. So this can lead to nausea and vomiting that is chronic. Patients with diabetes in general are at an increased risk for coronary artery disease due to vascular changes. They're also at an increased risk for stroke. And they're also at an increased risk for dementia later on in life as well. So you can see that many of these complications are very devastating. And there can be other associated conditions with diabetes as well, including type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes that I don't mention here. But these are the big ones I wanted to mention. So if you want to learn more about diabetes, type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes, please check out my full lessons on those topics. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you next time.